Well, Merry Christmas. It's a wonderful time of year, isn't it? Of course. And we want to have the best Christmas ever, right? Yes. <laughs> and we will. Christmas means celebrating. It means cold weather. It means decorations and good food and family. But did you ever wonder why we celebrate Christmas on December 25th? We certainly don't think Jesus was born in December. More than likely, it was summer. Could have been anywhere from April to September. So how did we land on December 25th? Well, we can actually thank the Catholic Church for that. We actually have no historical records of anyone celebrating Christmas before the Roman Emperor Constantine. St. Augustine, shortly after Constantine, had decided that Jesus was crucified in the spring and that he gave the death of Jesus, the date, March 25th. Well, it was also believed by some ancient Christians that a person died on the same day that they were conceived. In other words, they had a perfect life from beginning to end. So naturally that meant that Mary became pregnant with Jesus on March 25th. And that's what is celebrated with the Feast of Annunciation. This is the day the Catholic Church recognizes the angel Gabriel came to tell Mary that she was pregnant. Well, if Mary conceives on March 25th and a pregnancy is nine months, nine months from March is December 25th. And that's why we celebrate Christmas on December 25th today. In fact, Christmas became so popular that other pagan faiths grew jealous of all of our fun and they moved their holidays to coincide with ours. But the truth is, we owe it all to St. Augustine. But 700 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah told us that Jesus was coming. Isaiah 9 says, there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty, God, Everlasting, Father, and Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. We are looking at this passage this Christmas because it is the most earliest and most accurate description of Jesus in the Old Testament. We read verse 6 last week, and we said that joy comes with the birth announcement. It comes with the announcement that Jesus is the Messiah. March 25th is the Feast of Annunciation. It is a feast of joy. And I love the first descriptor that follows. His name shall be wonderful. And you might say, well, wait, Pastor David, my Bible says wonderful counselor. I know. But in truth, there are no commas in the original Hebrew. In fact, the entire thing is one long run-on sentence. It would read like this. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonder, Counselor, Mighty, God, Everlasting, Father, Prince of Peace. And so, not four titles, but seven. And that makes more sense that it is seven. God created the world in six days, and he rested on the seventh. In biblical numerology, seven symbolizes completion or perfection. Seven titles 
for our Savior's perfect love. Elsewhere in Isaiah 7, we read that his name is also Emmanuel. That's a lot of names. <laughs> it's a lot of titles for us to keep track of, which kind of makes us ask, well, who is Jesus? I get it. He's a lot of things. Understanding Jesus, who he is, can be confusing. So that's why I love this list here in Isaiah. And the first word Isaiah uses to describe Jesus is wonderful. Have you ever seen something so amazing that you just felt it was hard to describe? Sometimes you see something so wonderful, you're at a loss for words. How would you describe the moment when you started to drive without supervision and you got to listen to your favorite music the whole way? How would you describe that moment when your pet welcomes you home as if you were the best thing that's ever happened to them? How would you describe that moment when you receive a heartfelt thank you for impacting someone's life? How would you describe the moment when you found out your crush liked you back and you just couldn't stop smiling? How would you describe the moment when you first fell in love? The moment you held the baby of someone close to you and how innocent and how soft they are. How about when you feel something so wonderful that you just feel like you're where you're supposed to be. You know, you're, you're doing the thing you were supposed to do and you're thinking to yourself, I was, I was made for this. The birth of Jesus was so wonderful. His birth, so wonderful. It changed my life and it continues to change lives today. The announcement of his birth was wonderful that it came to the poorest of all. And after those shepherds came and saw and worshiped the baby king, when they left, nothing could hold them back. They told everyone of the wonder they had seen. Even the purpose, the very reason he was born is wonderful, because he was born to give his life. You know, he lived only 33 years. He never physically wrote a book. He never held a public office. He wasn't a homeowner. He wasn't an investment banker. He was poor. He only had 11 friends. He, he was betrayed by one of those, his own, uh, one of his own disciples. He was arrested. He was condemned. He hung on a cross. He was executed, even though he was innocent. But yet he changed history. His wonderful life changed the world. His wonderful love changed me. The second word here is counselor. A counselor is someone you listen to, someone you accept advice from. The problem for Israel is they had gotten into the habit of listening to all the wrong counselors. Look at Isaiah 8, verse 19. It says, And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? See, there were leaders in Israel who were giving the people bad advice. And these leaders were advising Israel to listen to someone other than God. Mediums and spiritualistic folks that talked to the dead. And Israel listened. But because Israel listened to these counselors, that ended up making their nation suffer. And so God was telling his people through Isaiah, you are walking in darkness. You are walking in a shadow of death because you have listened to the wrong counselors. But rejoice because unto you a child is born and a son will be given and he is gonna be a wonderful counselor. He is gonna be someone you can listen to and you will know that his advice is right. In fact, you'll be able to stake your life on the future that he tells you. But at the same time, Hebrews 4.15 says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. You know, we've been saying for a couple of weeks that there are people all around us that don't necessarily get into the Christmas spirit. There are other things in life that can get in the way. The good news is 
Jesus understands our problems. The Bible says he is sympathetic to our weaknesses. And so Jesus expresses his love as counselor because he has the power and the wisdom of God. He loves us and he knows our problems and he has the right to counsel and to help us deal with our problems. The key, of course, for us is to listen, to follow his advice. Third, Isaiah says he is mighty. You know, Christmas is about a baby. And during Christmas, we picture Jesus as this chubby, cute, little precious moments ornament, right? Like Jesus is the star of a Ann Getty's poster. And then that baby grows up and he becomes this kind of funny, cool substitute teacher. But remember, the passage in Isaiah is a birth announcement. It's not on a piece of stationery, though, with blue ribbon and pictures of flowers and baby sheep. Isaiah's birth announcement says, wonderful, counselor, mighty. And the fourth of, fourth of scripture says, God, right? Excuse me, but that is not soft or sweet or weak. The love of Jesus is strong and powerful and mighty. Jesus was not Mr. Rogers. Jesus was a person, and then when he spoke, people listened. You know, when he spoke, crowds gathered. When he spoke, disease vanished. When he spoke, the dead were raised. Remember once, Jesus spoke on a beach to 2,000 people without a microphone, and he held their interest for hours. I don't know what you picture when you picture Jesus in your mind, but Isaiah says he is mighty. But that also means there is nothing in your life, there is nothing in your past that can shake him. There's nothing in you that can make God flinch. Zephaniah says, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. You know, the Bible says as counselor, he sympathizes. And as mighty, he can take it. This mighty God loves you. And the next two words that Isaiah uses are everlasting and father. You know, probably just like you, I had some great friends growing up. Friends that you would do everything together with. And over the years, of course, Friendships like that, they always drift apart. Some of them you stay and connect with, and others probably you haven't seen in decades. And we can look back and reminisce, and we can say that we miss those times, those friendships, and I'm sure, you know, we can all relate. But the great thing about our Messiah is he is an everlasting father. That means his love never outgrows us. His love never loses interest in us. His love never drifts apart, never loses touch with us. Psalm 90 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That means his love is always there. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever because he is our everlasting Father. His love for us is permanent. Isaiah 54 says, with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. His love for you will never cease. <laughs> Either in this world or the next. In him you will have eternal joy, you will have eternal hope, you will have eternal glory, you will have eternal pleasure. In Christ you will be eternally blessed and secure because he is everlasting. He is always our provider, always our protector, and always our savior. You will always find refuge and strength in him. The second part of that is Isaiah says he is our father. Now, it can sound confusing, I know, for us to call Jesus Christ father. 
because up to this point, only God is really referred to as Father. For example, Psalm 89 says, you are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. But Father here doesn't translate to what we think a, a Father would mean. Here, Father is not, you know, the pr protector, provider, lawn mowing expert. Instead, the word here used would be like the chief, or the principal, or the owner, or the ruler, or the master. The word father here is less dad and more of what we would say as, you know, the, the founding father. The highest honor a nation can bestow on somebody was to say that they are the father of their country. Right? In America, that title belongs to George Washington. He was the supreme commander of the Army of the Potomac and the first president of the United States. In a similar way, Jesus may be considered as the father of his country, his kingdom. You know, his country is heaven and the vast extents of the universe is his kingdom. So if our nation gives its highest honor and respect to George Washington, certainly we as Christians, we would do no less for Jesus in regard to his kingdom. So by saying that the Messiah is everlasting and father, Isaiah alludes to the fact that, well, he is God, he is divine, and he owns it all. You know, the internet says that there are more than 20 million children who live in a home without the physical presence of a father. 20 million. Millions have uh, dads, but even though they're present, they are not emotionally present. If this were a disease, 20 million children being without a father, that would be an epidemic. That would be declared a national emergency. But the good news of Christmas is, no one needs to be without a father. Each and every one of them has a heavenly father, an almighty God, fully seen in Jesus, the baby born in Bethlehem. And Christmas says, that baby loves us. That Messiah loves us. The last title Isaiah gives us is Prince of Peace. I think of all the descriptors of Christmas, you know, I, peace is the hardest one, right? The candles on our Advent wreath represent all the weeks that we've been studying up to this point. Peace, hope, joy, love. And we love them all, but Christmas always feels rushed. It, it runs up on you like a flash and then it's over in a big pile of paper and dirty dishes. The kids run off to their rooms with their noisy batteries and mom and dad make a second pot of coffee. It's really no different when you have a day off from work. You know, you, you look forward to your day off and you say, ah, I'm gonna take it slow, I'm gonna relax right? But you don't. Maybe you could find some peace on your vacation. You look forward to your vacation. You say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let my hair down. I'm really going to put my toes in the sand and relax. But when your vacation comes, it's just go, 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 go. Life back in Jesus' day was no different. We always have this great nostalgia of, you know, yesteryear, and we look back to a simpler time, but the truth is, even people who lived back then were tired, rushed, hurried, spent, taxed, worn out, and dreaming about peace. Isaiah says Jesus came to bring peace. When Christmas says stress and planning and spending, remind yourself that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Right after verse 6, it ends with verse seven. It says, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. So this peace that we've been talking about is also forever. And it says, on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, how, how? How does this get done? Look at the last line, what does it say? The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. What is zeal? It doesn't say with his love he will do this. It says with his zeal. Zeal is 
energy. Zeal is enthusiasm. It's like an excitement, meaning God's enthusiasm is for you. God sent wonderful to you with enthusiasm. God loves you with enthusiasm. He burns for you. He's obsessed with you. He sent his son at Christmas. That's how much he loves you. And this love is available to you. This passage in Isaiah connects 700 years later to Christmas. Isaiah 9 says he's coming, and then the Gospels say he has come. So when I read these seven perfect descriptors of the one who brings light, of the one who chases away gloom, I read these seven titles as manifests for me of a God who is zealous for me. Wonder is available to you. His mightiness is available to you. His everlasting fatherhood is available to you. His peace is available to you. His love is available to you and it's established, and it's upheld, and it has no end. Let's pray together. God, we come before you and we celebrate Christmas. We are so grateful that you brought your son, Jesus, into this world. Thank you that your son walked among us, that he showed us what peace looked like, what hope looked like, what joy looked like, what love looked like. Help us this Christmas to find those things in our own lives. We are so grateful that he is wonderful. We know that there are those who are listening who need a little bit more of these in their homes this Christmas. People who need more wonder bring wonderful to their home and to their family. We are also so grateful that your son's counsel gives each one truth and wisdom. And yet we know that there are those who are listening who need more counsel in their homes this Christmas. They need your direction. They need your guidance. Bring wisdom and truth to their home and to their family. Thank you that Jesus is mighty, that he is God a God who stands be between us and our crises. And so we ask God to bring healing from every evil and every pain that would seek to take us down. If we pray against disease, against scars, and we invite Jesus to bring life and wholeness into our homes. Your word describes Jesus also as everlasting Father. And yet there are those who are listening who need more everlasting in their home this Christmas. Bring forever to their home and to their family. Bring fathers to the fatherless. Bring comfort to the widow and to the orphan. Hallelujah that Jesus is our Prince of Peace. Give each one listening peace. Bring peace to our households. from today and throughout the seven more days until Christmas. Be the Prince of Peace for us. When your son came with zeal and love, we are so grateful that we have that love and that that love has touched so many. Lord, I pray as for an unbelievable blessing on each household and each individual listening I pray for an overwhelming sense of peace. I pray for your mightiness, for it to move. I pray for love and comfort. I pray for healing and for life. From now through Christmas, each time we see a light. Each time we hear a bell, we remember Jesus. For each time we see a star, we remember how he brought us all wonderful. 
and how his birth casts out darkness and declared no more gloom. May each one have the best Christmas ever. Amen. Thank you all so much for listening to our Advent series. Of course, our next time together will be Christmas Eve. And so on Christmas Eve, we have two services here. We have one in the morning and one in the evening. Our morning service will be at 1030. Our evening service is at 630. And they will be completely identical in both song, sermon, and candles. And so please choose the service that works the best for you and for your family. I love you guys. Have a great holiday. Merry Christmas.